facetious remark, but uh, this one kind of stands on its own. This passage. Um, and we're going to be talking about the most important question. Before I start the suit, I pray. Father in God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is unchanging, just like you are. And the world has changed so much so rapidly from day to day and week to week. Uh, so many unstable things, so many unsure things. We can always rely on your word. We can rely that it doesn't change. It's the same for every culture. It's the same for every time in history. And Father, you do the same. And we are so grateful that, first and foremost, you're God's love. You're full of grace and compassion, forgiving sin and rebellion. And yet, Father, you also are the judge. And we, we, we will come before you someday and give account for our lives. We pray that today you're honored, you're lifted up. Give us open hearts and open minds. I know there's some encouraging things and sharing today, and there's some very challenging things. I pray that you would help people to stay in their seats, to hear, and to let us all be dealt with by your word so that we can become more like Jesus, yeah. more mm-hmm. like him, act more like him, um, be the influence of him in this very, very perfect needs to grow up. Uh, thank you right now, God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. The most important question. Uh, it's been said that a lot of life is about asking the right questions. You know, things like, does this come with a guarantee? Right? That, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Will you marry me? That's a good question. Okay. Uh, is Jesus actually the Son of God? Uh, a lot of times, it's about asking the right questions. And Einstein said famously many, many years ago, he said, if I had one to answer a question and then my life is dependent on getting the right answer. I would spend 55 minutes thinking about what's the question to ask, and then five minutes to solve the problem. Mm-hmm. So what I'm going to start with today is literally a moment of silence, and hopefully you're taking notes so that you know how to memorize speeches verbally. Uh, here then. Um, either on your phone or on a piece of paper, and I want you to answer this question. We're going to have a minute of silence for you to answer this question. Right now in your life, what is the most important question for you right now? What is the most important question for you right now in your life? So take a quiet moment there, right now. So we're in Mark chapter 12, and we'll come back to that question that you just wrote down about yourself. Um, the passage we're going to study today covers uh, several people asking Jesus questions. Uh, three people, in fact, three, three different groups. Uh, two of the questions are actually not good questions, but Jesus uses them anyway as an opportunity to teach people some important stuff about God. One of the questions could arguably be the most or one of the most important questions you could possibly ask. Then at the end of the passage, Jesus turns around, and I, I don't know if he's sick and tired of being asked questions, the Lord tends not to be impatient at all, but he decides to turn around and he asks questions. And of course, nobody can answer his question. And they're all left kind of speechless. And he says, we're kind of familiar with how we spoke. And of course, nobody answered his question. Okay? And so today, I want you to allow yourself to think about what questions am I asking of God? And not just selfishly, Lord, help me with this, bless me with that, change that. What am I asking of God? And if I allow myself, toward the end of this message, I'm going to read some questions that Jesus asked us in the scriptures. And one of the most challenging uh, New Testament studies I've done is just go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and write down every question of Jesus. And, and, and sit, sit there and allow myself, like I'm being questioned by him in person. Because we are in the scriptures. And so the, I'm going to, you know, challenge you then to think about if you're questioned by Jesus, how would you do it? 
Okay. So we'll just dive into Mark chapter 12. Oh, by the way, um, this go party last night. Um, I'll just say for those of you who didn't come, we're going to have to do this again because it was a light pain for them. <laughs> I came home and I iced my ankle for 45 minutes. <laughs> and like, how are you doing? And I'm like, glorious. Hey, it's a shame. Did the strike have to do that? Well, I'm going to go to the for the event. I found myself doing real disco moves just watching the shit. Look at that. I feel the rhythm for once in my life. I'm going to have to call the team all kinds of stuff. It's fantastic. Uh, I didn't even have the rest of that tenure. Yeah. I didn't have to throw it like after the year. He had a mustache going on. He did go to I'm just ready to introduce myself. And then he talks, and I recognize the jersey accent, of course. We have Vaughn, Toronto, and he won the big But I'm not the first thing. I think he wore these shoes. Yeah. And he wore the heels of the platform shoes. That just doesn't happen anymore. I was wondering what that'd be like just if I walked out to you and walked out to dance in the platform shooting goldfish at the same way. Look at the rest. Okay. Back to Bible. Sorry, I digress there. Um, I was also shocked how many people had a disco ball at home. All these little disco balls. Is that, is that all you No. Okay. Okay, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Point one, questioning Jesus to prove him wrong. Questioning Jesus to prove him wrong. Not a good idea. Mark 12, verse 17. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said to the teacher, We know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you preach and teach the word of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to come in yet? Bring his image and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar did a lie. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at that. It's not immediately apparent to find such an amazing answer. But as we get into it a little bit closer, that this was the most perfect and most challenging answer Jesus could have possibly given these guys. Uh, and there, in verse 14, it says that they tried to catch Jesus in his words. Uh, it's interesting, um, whenever you have a word in the Greek that appears only one time, they're probably selected for a very specific reason. This is that word for catch. This is the only time it occurs in the New Testament. And it actually means binding for cities. Like a lion chasing his prey. So these guys, they really went out to prove Jesus wrong. They were out to pursue him and literally try to devour him by his answer. That's how strong that word is. And of course, the practice is should they pay the imperial tax to, to Rome or not? Now, for the Jews, they actually believed that the only tax a man should ever pay was the temple tax in their times. And no man should ever receive taxes from God's people. Than considered a huge sin and man putting himself in the place of God. On the other hand, the imperial tax was something that the Roman government levied on all subject peoples throughout the Roman Empire. And to not pay this and teach other people not to do this would be considered subverting the government and would be punished at least by imprisonment, if not by death. So they thought, okay, if we put Jesus in a position where all the Jews would think he's sinning against God by saying pay the tax. On the other hand, if he says don't pay the tax, the Roman government will imprison him or kill him. He's got no place to go. And this is the violent pursuing the great kind of kill Jesus, this kind of question. I think the reputation among the Jews are really to be killed by the Romans. That's the question. I love what they say before they even get to the trap, though. They, they explain Jesus' reputation in verse, beginning in verse 14. Wouldn't you love to have this be said about you if you're a Christian? Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. These are people who can't stand in that. You aren't swayed by others because you pay, you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. What a reputation. Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. We all have some reputation. That's, that's an interesting question. What is your reputation among people who know you? 
So people will know about your faith. But that doesn't get in my notes, so I'll move on. Okay. So Jesus is most challenging a perfect answer here in verse 16 and 17. He goes, I'm looking at you see what he starts. Interestingly, Jesus didn't even have a point. So he had a point. So he gave me four. So you look, okay, and so there are Caesars uh, with semi divine busts on the one side. Uh, with an the Latin inscription. Yeah. And he says, Well, who is that? Well, it's Caesar. Well, that clearly belongs to him. And then get to God with belongs to God. Now, for every Jew, they understood Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and following, the famous statement, Let us make man in our image. And that's why Jesus used the same word image to describe his own point. He'd say, This painter or this inscription, he said image on purpose because. Often Jews knew their Bible so well, the Old Testament, that all it would take is a word or two to trigger an entire phrase chapter or story. So, well, whose image is this? And yeah, you give that to Caesar, and then you give to God what is God. And they immediately thought image of God is in the image. Mm, wow. Well, well, which, which is the greater thing? To give a coin to Caesar or to give your whole self to God? And so the perfect answer is because he, both Caesar and God were honored in a way they weren't to be honored. Caesar weren't to give the guy his own. Yeah. But God wants all of you. Yeah. Not part of you. And that's the people who exercise it. If you think you're good with God just because you give your contribution, he's not interested in that. He's interested in all of you. Right. Yeah. And what is the difference between you belonging to God completely and you believing in God? Yeah. What does a life look like? That's the question I'm asking. What does a life look like that belongs to God as opposed to just believing God? What does that look like? Question to you Wholehearted versus half-hearted. Wholehearted versus half-hearted. Okay. Other questions. Uh, being selfless. And that's that's the belonging to God. Is, is you're selfless. Yeah. Okay. What you spend most of your time thinking about. Your mental energy, what you spend most of your time thinking about. You know, is it the Lord or is it your own things? Who you are when no one's looking. Who you are when no one is looking. Mm -hmm. Interesting. On uh, Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, grace repeats most often. Mm -hmm. It seems like don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, but your father who sees what he has done in secret will reward you. And he repeats that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. God is so interested in who you are when no one's looking. And that shows who's belonging to God. Not the other question of belonging versus disbelieving. Yeah. Go ahead. Just thinking how if you would be practically taking actions um, to pursue that relationship with God versus mm -hmm. so in pursuing your relationship with God, doing things part of your life rather than just showing up. You know, your your faith should not be consist of church meetings and churchy things. But it's you belonging like him and I married in a Christian marriage, you belong to yourself. You don't do things independently. You think first and foremost of the other person before you make a decision, before you spend money, how you figure out how you're going to live your week. And, and, and I know if we don't touch base and have a good conversation for a couple of days, we don't have time. We have to be in constant communication with each other to, to get along with that body. It's needed all the time. Same thing with God. Is God something that you throw 15 minutes at the start of your day and the rest of the day you live for yourself? And then, if, and then if it gets tough, it's a tough thing to have to know, oh, are you praying to God? Or do you belong to God? Does your job belong to God? Does your stuff belong to God? Do your talent belong to God? Or do you just pray for God to bless the lifestyle you've already set? Jesus, with that same little coin, oh, you're trying to catch me, you're trying to pursue me with that little coin. Who's on it? See, yeah. Why don't you give this uh, a puny little piece of silver? This thing that We'll dig up a couple thousand years from now. We'll give you to it. Why don't you go ahead and do that to Caesar? And you get to die with this all the way. And the people were unnoticed. 
And it may be, yeah, that, that's an, also an interesting word for you because it can also be um, terrifying. It can mean, it can mean like, wow, it can mean like, oh. it's, it, it's, it's a combination of, I haven't expected that, I'm stupefied and challenged at the same time. They were amazed. And I bet that parents who put that little coin back in his pocket. Thank you. Thank you for the input. Walk away. You belong to God in this reason. Point two. Questioning Jesus to prove one's own theological position. Questioning Jesus to prove one's own theological position. Also a dumb idea. Mark chapter 12, verse 18. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no religion, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses proved for us that if a man is first adopted, he needs a wife and no children. The man that's married the widow will raise up offspring for his brother. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died with no child. It was the same as the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. Whose wife, whose wife will she be? So the seven will marry her. Jesus replied, here's a big slap in the face to the biblical scholars. Are you not in error? Because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given marriage. They will be like the angels of heaven. But about the dead rising, how do you not know the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush? How God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead. But if you live in, you are badly mistaken. <laughs> what is seeing Jesus to prove one's own theological position? So the Sadducees were actually the biblical conservatives compared to the Pharisees. Okay? Because the Old Testament doesn't talk a whole lot about angels and demons and the afterlife. But it's not as, as frequent as the New Testament at all. So the Pharisees, they kind of took the little bit there and built more on it. They were actually on the right track. But the Sadducees, they, they believe in the first five books of Moses, especially, and they denied the existence of angels, they denied that there were such things as demons, and they denied the angels. That was their position. But they thought they had the perfect question because in the law of Moses, what exactly was supposed to happen was one of the laws here. You might be thinking, especially the women here might be thinking, that's the sun so bad. Here's the thing. You gotta understand how widows were treated in the day of Jesus. The one of those progressive religions back today is Hinduism. Uh, up until very recently in India, like the last 40 years, uh, if a woman was left and her husband died, they would have the funeral pyre with this corpse on top and burn him as the funeral procession, and she would be burned alive with him. It was called you know, immolation. And that was part of the new thing. Okay? Um, at the very least, in other cultures other than the Jewish culture, if a woman was with them, she was usually a beggar left on the street and often had to turn to prostitution. So this was the law of Moses to uh, both to continue the husband's name, that was one thing, to continue his lines, so that he, was, he can have a family forever before God in Israel, and all of the Jews were given a land allotment so that they could also keep the land and not lose property, that the woman could be taken care of by him, be in, within a land and property, and be cared for. So that's actually a kind and compassionate practice that the Jews had in the law of Moses. So you don't get all distracted with what's going on? I'm a Muslim. Okay. So they thought they had the perfect argument. Uh, you know, this woman, she's a widow, uh, no kids, six other brothers marry her, they don't have any kids. You know, if I'm going to be I'd be feeling pretty sketchy about it. Oh man, what's going on here? Anyway, um, so they thought that the Sadducees had kind of had the idea. That if there's an afterlife which we don't believe in, it's just kind of the transposition of life here on earth. That's what they thought. It's just the same. Mm. And they had this old point that we're like angels. There's not marriage going on there. There's not families going on there. It was contrary to a very popular belief in this part of the country. Uh, but uh, Jesus says very clearly, you're not married in the life to come. Wherever you're married, you're on earth. It doesn't continue elsewhere. Okay? And he simply says to these guys, this huge slap in the face, you know, you guys, and mind you, most of the Sadducees had most of all of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, memorized. I mean memorized, okay? 
These guys were the Bible experts of their day. And he says to them, you don't know the scriptures or the plan of God. Wow. That would be the equivalent of saying that all the people, researchers and analysts and CPAs and all these other people who manage hedge funds and do all kinds of stuff on Wall Street collectively know nothing about plans. <laughs> I think kind of like saying something like that. Uh, and, and mind you, this word also for that you're you, you're an error is to wander off track and to be led astray. That you are wandering off and you're also letting yourself be led by other people. You know how kind of people group think one person thinks similar to somebody else, and you kind of foment each other's opinions and continue to lead each other off track in a group of people saying thinking similar. And so they were very hard in those beliefs. There's no afterlife. And mind you, this is not a minor point. Their theological uh, uh, view made them miss the life after death and all spiritual beings in the spiritual realm. This is not minor. This is a fringe point of their faith. It's a major part of their faith. Now, what's Jesus' argument? Here, Jesus challenges me even more. Sadducees, they, they would pray all the time to the day. And the way that a typical Sadducees type prayer would begin with to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's what you Comes back, you started most of your prayers. That was their tradition. Okay? So he takes out of their mouth one of the most common phrases they repeat multiple times in a day and turns it around and helps them realize you don't even know what you're saying. You don't even know what's flying out of your mouth. Okay? The burning bush, when God first identified himself as I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is when um, he lights a bush on fire that is not consumed. Moses is out there tending sheep, he sees this sight, goes over, and this is where God the name is called Moses to deliver the Israelites out of slavery. Okay? But Moses was kind of, he, he wasn't doing his best spirit to even out, kind of get jaggy out there 40 years in the wilderness, not really having a flight. So he was a little bit rusty. Well, who, who should I say send me? What, what's your name? Why did God and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob take off your sins because we're ashamed of holy man? We don't have space. Pretty nice. Okay. So that's what God did. Now, Jesus makes the argument. He says, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. When Moses heard these words, Abraham had been dead more than 300 years. All right? 50, Jacob, like 200. These guys have been dead. Been dead. But by saying that, Jesus saying, he's not the God of what that actually means is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive to God in some plane somewhere right now. You are badly mistaken. And he had used their prayer intro that they prayed five times a day their whole life and turned it around and didn't even know what they were saying. I've been growing up. We recited the Apostles' Creed in my church. And it was only once I started studying the Bible seriously, I went back to see what was I going to have out of my mouth every single day. <laughs> and it's some pretty serious stuff you believe, right? Sure. I think people up there think God is not going to come in. I look around, nobody's like pointing in their spirit, saying, and I'm like, oh, I don't want someone in the spirit. You know, wow, he's coming to judge the quick and the dead. What's that? He's coming to judge the quick and the dead, meaning he's going to judge every single soul if you're not going to die and going to hell. The whole time is going to judge the day. And no people. Like, oh my goodness. All kinds of stuff flying out of our mouth. We don't even think about it. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, Well, God said, well, the man is not survived by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word. Here, Jesus makes an argument proving the affirmation by the tense of one verb. How well do you know your Bibles? How well do you know your Bibles? I, I, I'm going to, now, I prayed in the beginning, I don't often pray before I preach, but that's because I'm going to say some stuff, I'm going to offend some religious folks here, and I you don't leave, if you're ticked off, talk to me afterwards, and we'll set up a time to talk in detail. But I'm just going to lay some smack out here. Okay? Uh, this stuff about messing around with just one word. People mess around with baptism all the time. People say it's an outward sign of inward grace. That is not appear anywhere in the Testament. At all. Uh, people say things like, um, it's a message. 
It's something super important to do, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Go go and explain all kinds of things. Oh no, it's actually as simple as that the Holy Spirit is not really water and all this. Why don't you just go to the Bible and read it straight up like it actually says? And if you got notes, they sent out an email, they're there, you know, it says in Acts 2 38 specifically, baptism is to receive the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. That's either true or it's not. And if you're not forgiven and you have the Holy Spirit, can you be saved? Well, in case you're in doubt, 1 Peter 3 21 literally says, in baptism, you are saved. Said it right there. I think Peter knew what he was talking about. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says in baptism, you are united with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where you claim his death for yourself. It also says in Romans 6, you're baptized into Christ, which means that prior to baptism, you are outside of Christ. Not a man, not a Christian. Okay? Um, John 3, 3 through 5, Jesus says, you must be born again of the water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. You won't go to heaven without the water and the spirit. And the passage in verse 22 gives us outside baptism. It's clearly a passage about baptism. Colossians 2, 11 and 12, you're circumcised of your sinful nature in baptism. You have your sinful nature until you're baptized, and then Jesus circumcises the way in baptism. I'm not even going to take the time to look at the other 15 references that all connect baptism to your salvation. And, and religious people get mad at us because we just take out the Bible straight out of what it says and don't add to it. And, and don't do these, these games with the Bible where if we're talking about baptism, we jump over to a verse on grace. If you want to know what baptism is for, look up baptism verses. Yeah. Yeah. Now, instead of being warned by the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, that we in our religiosity may just be like them. We wipe them off as being extremely arrogant and proud. And we share Jesus on when he challenges these people in the scriptures. Not that you saw them for a second and said, wait a minute, who would the Pharisees and Sadducees be in our day in religious America? Wow. Evangelical Christianity. Uh, where people have all kinds of traditions added on to just straight up the Bible says. And then they get mad at people who just know the Bible says this. We're ignorant because we do not know the scriptures and the power of God. In any case, when I was 22 years old, I was living in Sweden, helping to start a church. We were all there. The, old, the oldest person in the group was like 25. Um, that's not very good. And that's not a lot of wisdom. And you're all pretty stupid to love Jesus together. So um, I, I started praying that God would lead us to um, some older people who love God who could become elders in our church at an early time in the church's formation. Okay. I commuted about an hour to the city north of Stockholm to, to go to school there um, every morning on, on this train. And so I get up, it's you know, early, early morning, and get on the train, and everybody's looking all kind of groggy, and it's a commuter train. And I go next to this guy who's in there, priest outfit, and he's he's reading and taking notes, and he's kind of like, I can't read. 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 Can I just ask a couple of questions? And then I said, actually, about an hour ago, I was afraid that God would leave us. This was an old looking back. He's like, oh, big for the So he looked at me. And I said, I'm just done praying. I mean, we're starting the church here. I just have to done praying. We meet some older, wise people who love God. And here you are. Who do I have a seat? I have a seat with the guy. He was the bishop of the entire Lutheran church in the whole country of Sweden. Oh, okay, okay. He had just moved from uh, Boston, right, to Cambridge, because he had been the dean of Harvard Divinity School about 10 years. This guy was a big shot, but I didn't know any of because he didn't tell me that. Uh, he was like, yes, yeah. And I'm like, I asked some of my questions I had, and I said, um, can we study the Bible? And he goes, you with me. Um, or you can just mean, uh, but maybe I don't get it. I'd like to have the questions with you at least and come with my Bible about some things, right? Uh, and uh, he said, sure. He said, he gave me an appointment. Okay. 
And he says, could you do me a favor? Can you hand it to me? He says, well, business card. Could you read these two books before we have them? And I'm like, hey, this is a heck, this is something out here. So we get so I go buy the books. Lo and behold, if I look at the business card, then the guy who wrote the books, <laughs> he at that time, this is a number of years ago, he was considered the greatest living scholar of the life of Paul. That's who this guy was. Okay. So I mean my three months came. I'll tell you what, I read this book several times. Okay, taking notes and all things. But we sit down and we we had some questions about the Holy Spirit and baptism, which was very clear, uh, like based on Acts chapter two and other things. And I said, this is not what you said it means in your book. And I said that I don't know what it means. Could you get out your Greek New Testament and read read that to me? What what does that say? Yes, it's for the forgiveness of sin, but it's to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the definition of the Greek. Okay. So, so who's, who's your book? That's not what the book says. Literally, this is what the guy says. Touche. Great point. Oh. And he goes, I, I can't change that. I have to rewrite this. I said, this is, this is like forgiveness of sin and the Holy Spirit. It's kind of significant. And he goes, you have a prodigy. I appreciate it. And thanks for bringing this to my attention. And it was a well played match. He, he considered it like a chess match. This is a guy who influences 8 million people in this country for his interpretation of the Bible. I can tell you a single Greek letter in the New Testament about it. Now it's turned into a little bit, a little bit. But, um, He was completely off on a major point of forgiveness of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit. This is not minor periphery Christianity love. Do we have a great interpretation of revelation? It's central. And I tell you, there are a lot of spiritually educated theologians, ministers who do not take the Bible straight up. And if you read the Bible, just the New Testament for what it is, you would not become Catholic. You would not become Lutheran, Episcopalian, Baptist, none of those. You become a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you just read it without any previous knowledge, just read the New Testament. You wouldn't become any of these denominations. So this stuff in Mark 12 is not very far from here. I'm going to go on trip. Oh, in my notes, I like this phrase. This was used on me as I was studying the Bible. Thought that I would be and, and the guy, the guy said to me, hey, are, are you going to send her somewhere Christian? I said, you know. Well, you have a lot of beliefs and opinions about things in Christianity. Uh, do you know where it is in the Bible that you talk about? Or you probably know what's well, in there somewhere. But you don't really know where it is. And I said, like, like what? You know, like praying Jesus into your heart. He goes, well, where's that from? Um, hang on, let me, let me, and I have a course in the back and it's in here. All right. Good. Yeah. You're pretty convinced of this. And you think it's in there somewhere, but it's not. And I'm talking to members of the church too. Yeah. How many of you in your Bible just rely on, oh, there's some other guys up there, some ladies doing some sharing, they're going to keep us on track. Mm. Infant baptism, over 800 million people are baptized in infants in this world. Nowhere in the Bible. And praying Jesus in your heart, nowhere in the Bible. Why do this up? This is not minor because both of those views of how you get saved can lack repentance. If you do not repent, you cannot be saved. Babies can't repent. And praying Jesus in your heart, maybe a person repents. I remember a couple times my life was completely undented. I just felt this warm, fuzzy feeling of the presence of the Lord. Yeah. You know, chili burrito. It's all I can do. I was well meaning, I was well intentioned. That's what I can say. But you can't blow off repentance. repentance. Jesus said in Luke 13, if you don't repent, you perish. Period. Sometimes people teach that repentance is feeling sorry for your sins. I remember when I went to that stage. I, I was religious enough uh, that I went to church attendance, reading the Bible, trying to share my faith, not using the Lord's name in vain, and, you know, let's not. Uh, you know, have sex outside of marriage, then I'm good with God. There's all these things not do. Don't do, don't do, don't do. Okay. Um, but um, I thought that I was really grown as a Christian when I started feeling bad about myself. 
I didn't change, but just feeling guilty, I thought, you know, I appreciate that. The rest of my, the rest of my buddies are partying. They're just enjoying themselves. I, I can't even enjoy myself anymore. At least I'm feeling bad about it. That is repentance. Then there's faith alone, saved by faith alone. The only time that phrase shows up in the New Testament is James chapter 2, verse 24. And it simply says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. That's the only time the phrase occurs. Specifically saying we're not saved by faith alone. There are people who teach that once you're saved, you can't lose your salvation. All over the New Testament. I have a bunch of scriptures in, in your notes there, 1 Corinthians 15, Hebrews 6, 10, 2 Peter 2. Um, God doesn't take away your free will when you, when you become a Christian. You can walk away from God. God predestines everyone's faith, other people talk about, you know, especially Calvin. Acts chapter 17 talks that God tries to arrange circumstances in the best possible way that people reach out and perhaps find it. But God doesn't force anybody into a relationship with him. But he tries to set up everything he possibly can to give everybody the best thing. And then we have to make a decision. Not to blame God against me. There's all kinds of teaching about holy water, holy places, holy people, holy days, holy cows. Okay? <laughs> but but yeah, it, there, there is holy stuff in the Old Testament. Not in the New Testament. And then finally... There are a number of groups that teach that prophets and apostles on earth that continue to reveal God's will, adding to the scriptures, not true. John chapter 16, Jesus gave a special gift to the 12 apostles, 11 of them, and Judas had left, saying that he would guide them specifically back to the all truth, remind them of his words. When they go to replace Judas because he killed himself, in Acts chapter 1, they talk about the qualifications to be one of Jesus' apostles who have to have been with Jesus during his entire earthly ministry. Be a witness of Jesus getting baptized and Jesus being raised from the dead. Then you might be able to become an apostle of Jesus. And there are only two guys in the whole crowd who fulfill that these qualifications. Meaning Jesus and the apostles had a definite time period and then no more. So I just laid a bunch of schmack out there and laid it over the ass. And if I did offend you seriously, if I offended you, bothered you, please talk to me after we'll have some have some extended time together. And I'll even make it some nice pasta if you like. Or tea or something. But let me let me put some splinter in your mind here. If you're wrong about the plan of salvation, if you're wrong about how somebody becomes a Christian, how can you be a Christian? And I say to our members in our church, this is not to look down or be critical of anybody else, but if you don't understand who's lost and who's saved, how can you see the same lost people? Our own our own church needs conviction. That this stuff matters. And I think that we wouldn't just be so numb to, oh, we're in a religious environment. There's a lot of people who love Jesus right here. Finally, a sincere question about what is most important. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Mark 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Pretty big question. The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is man greater than these? Well said, teacher, man of God. You're right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love them with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. How that must have gone through him. Who is this guy that told me that? You're not far from the kingdom of God. How do you know that? And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. <laughs> Get to the question time. <laughs> Mm. There's no evidence that this teacher of the law had any hidden agenda around the city. It simply says here that noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. And so I believe this man was sincere. And I, there, there was a lot of Sadducees and Pharisees who I think love God and tried their best they could. It says in Acts chapter 6, by that point in the early church, many priests, Jewish priests, were coming to be into the faith. So there are a lot of people who love God. In that group. And I think this is one of those guys who's been wandering his whole life, literally dreamed of being a teacher of the 
law. So there's 613 commandments in the first five books of the Bible. Man, what should I focus on? There's so much in there. I feel like that I'm, I'm hitting the mark here. I'm fulfilling the will of God. And here's a guy who's really teaching the Bible so well. Maybe he can give me some insight. I think he got genuinely sincere more than that. And so he said, Hey, what's kind of the most important? And Jesus says, Oh, he gives us more than we ask for. He gives two. He gives two commands back to us. Now, in the Greek, this is the interesting thing. The Greek phrase here, when the guy actually asks the question, he says to him, which commandment supersedes everything else and is incumbent on all humanity, including Gentiles? That's the actual sense of the question. So, I mean, I think preaching is really hard to speak where people say, hey, if I'm not a Christian, why would you apply to me? This, this guy wanted to know what commandment is not just Jewish people, but for everybody, and is above everything else. And since we're all created by God, we're all in the image of God, we all owe ourselves to God, we all belong to God. This is for everybody. Wow, what a question. Probably the most important, if not one of the top, at least two, three, you know, all of our, our life. This is the heart of Christianity. The entire Old Testament is fulfilled with those two today. All 613 are fulfilled with just those two. Now, if you've been straining yourself about the 613, if you've been one of those Christians like, where do I start? How do I do? How do I know how I'm built? That can be really good too. But if you look at Jesus' teachings, it's kind of a double edged sword. The other side of it is, it's this it's not just religious behavior. If you don't love God with every single facet of your personality, you're not right. That's the challenge. Now, what Jesus does in this, the way he answers, it's the perfect answer in that. He avoids this um, kind of airy fairy mysticism about loving God. I know that uh, many years ago I said, hey, I love God because of my feelings, and there wasn't much that was looking at God. But it is mystical me and God's personal pastorship. So, okay? And, and, and he kind of eliminates the mysticism of that because number two, right next to you is loving your neighbor as yourself. So you can quickly see if you love God because you love people. You do something. Do you love lost people? Do you love lost people as a Christian? Or do you love the church? Do you have different relationships? If, if God, if you love God, you love the things that God loves, and you hate the things that God hates. Yeah. God so loved the world as a Christian, your life should be chock full of sharing Jesus with other people. Well, at least sharing your life that, so people can feel the love of Jesus for you, and maybe it takes a little while to get around to what Jesus did. But you should be actively loving lost people, aware of your mission and your purpose. Yeah. I get sick and tired of Christians that don't think you're building about that evangelism. It's not a question of evangelism, it's a question of love. Yeah. Loving your neighbor. Do you love your neighbor? And then he also would wish you watched humanism, where uh, this is where a lot of my Swedish neighbors were. They're very kind and good, they contribute a lot to. All kinds of organizations around the world um, they do a lot of good and serve humans, but they believe in God. So they believe if I love my fellow human being, if there is a God, he'll let me in. No? You, you, this takes away just being humanistic. It's the process to love God, not just people. It's the perfect answer. Our life should be a life of love. Our whole life should be rearranged about how we can love God in a way. Our whole life. No matter what our job is, no matter how young we are, that's what it should all be about. Like I said, who measures to love God by loving what he loves and hating what he hates? Do you love your neighbor? If, if getting into heaven, and I'm not saying it's all down to this, but if getting into heaven was a lot about how much you love your neighbor, how would you do it today was less? Mm -hmm. It's easy to love people. And even then, we have trouble. There's some people on that to look around and find out there's a chance. Yeah. 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 In church this side. There's a couple of people in the church that don't have to hang out with them, but these people I love. It's easy to love. But people try and be like Christians. Final point, question by Jesus. So he finally, he just turns around and decides, let me ask a couple of questions here. 1235. While Jesus was teaching the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of God? 
They themselves speaking by the Holy Spirit declared, and here's the genius of Jesus and the Bible. The Sadducees and Pharisees disagreed about many, many things in the Bible. This is one of the few passages that both groups agree talked about the Messiah. They both agree on this one. So he read, he cites and quotes to him. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies on your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? Lord, I'm just living with the light. But nobody said anything, nobody answered his question. So here's the messianic passage where David's talking about David said to the Lord, said to my Lord, and this one, the generations on the line, is the one about the Messiah. So he says, So wait, David calls the one that's coming after him, the Messiah, his Lord, also the same word that he used for God. How then can this one be just his son? Son. Go over to Matthew chapter 5. You're going to experience just for maybe a minute my question by Jesus to study I did for myself. And just imagine Jesus asking you these questions. What do you say? Matthew 5 26. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Oh, that means the tax reward for that? I, I'm not privileged to love your family and you know your best friends. I'm really not impressed. Mommy of us has loved their families. <laughs> I'm really not impressed. Sit back to 625. And he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or what you drink, about your body, what you wear. Here's the question. Is that life and women's food in the body and women's clothes? How much time do we spend shopping for food? Cooking food? Worrying about it, food, keto, this stuff, that kind of high mind, mm. <laughs> intermittent fasting. Mm. Okay, then this is what we're going to be. And now, how much time are we spend thinking about clothes? What we're wearing? Some of you are like, hey, well, there's something here to do a lot. 627. Can any of you, by worrying, have a single hour of your life? No, but you can certainly shorten your life by worrying. You can shorten it for sure. Okay? Uh, 73. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to planting in your own eye? Question by Jesus. Good. Nothing. 826. He replied, You little faith, why are you so afraid? You can park on that one all day long. I mean, and you see the rest of your notes. But, I mean, it's such an exercise going through it, allowing yourself to be questioned by Jesus. Through, through, this is the living word of God. It is Jesus speaking to us in our day to day. And he asks us these questions to quicken our spirit, to help us spin more of the God, to understand more about God and his love. So, kind of just ending here, I want you to ask yourself two questions. How does a life look if one belongs to God instead of just believes? And which does my life look like? Question two, how well do I know my Bible? Am I just dependent on other people? Question three, do I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? And of course, the main question to help me answer that, do I love what God loves to the case? And finally, do I allow myself to be questioned by Jesus? There's a lot of stuff in this passage. This is one of those toasty sermons. But if a sermon doesn't call you to do something, it utterly fails. And it's supposed to help you get closer to God, become more like Jesus. That's the point of this. What we're going to do now is we have an opportunity. We're going to sing, to prepare our hearts for communion. Tim's going to come and then pray for it. And we have these questions to think about. Right? Taking communion. So let's stand together and sing some song, and then come back on prayer.